Hello and welcome to the first session of our F1 Aerodynamics Workshop Series. So I'm very happy to, to see so many new user and faces and yes, um, in the next three weeks we will discover and investigate the world of F1 Aerodynamics. You will learn a lot about the fundamentals and also how to use CFD flow simulations for your own F1 design projects. But first of all, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me. So therefore, please click the raise hand button in the case you can hear me loud and fine. I see some, some hands. Please raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, that looks good. In the case someone has problems with the audio or the audio quality drops uh, during the webinar, you can see uh, on this slide um, uh, the, the toll-free uh, audio service numbers we are providing. And you can use this toll-free number together with the access code to, to, uh, to access uh, the, the audio of this webinar uh, over your phone. Okay, great. But then let's start and first of all take a look into the agenda. So today it's our first session and it's mainly about front wing design and front wing aerodynamics. So first of all we'll have a kind of, of short and crisp introduction into this webinar series. So what is the aim of the webinar uh, and, and some other organizational things. Uh, then uh, my dear friend and our co today's co-presenter Akram from uh, Friendship Systems will give you an introduction to the fundamental of F1 aerodynamics and we'll talk about uh, F1 aerodynamics in general but also about the process from the design to the racetrack. Then I will give you a live demonstration of SimScale and we'll together set up a fluid flow simulation of a Formula 1 front wing. We'll discuss the results and then I will present your homework assignment to you and then we we'll also have time for your questions. Okay then, let's start. Um, yes, first of all my name is Milot. I'm working at SimScale as a marketing program manager so my job is to make sure that SimScale becomes the best place for engineering simulation for all engineers in the world. And I have a mechanical engineering background and worked, I'm working with engineering simulation for more than 10 years now. And just because a lot of people ask me. So the idea of this workshop is really to, to give insights uh, about F1 aerodynamics in general and uh, how to, to use it with simulation to, to everyone who's interested in this, especially to petrol hats, F1 hats, engineering students. And the, a, the aim, aim in the end is that you are able to use our three tools um, to, to optimize uh, uh, aerodynamical design yourself. So you will get a lot of hands-on experience with simulation. Therefore, this is not a kind, it's not a training uh, about simulation theory uh, or a training about the practical application of simulation. So this webinar series is really dedicated to F1 and in the case you're interested in the fundamentals of simulation or you want to, to, to find out about more the, the, the general practical application of simulation and sim skill in industrial projects, uh, I would recommend you to, to consult our documentation and we are also offering a professional training uh, which uh, costs 500 euro but the good thing is you can qualify for a free professional training by submitting all three homeworks but let's talk about this later on. And just because when people ask why we're doing these workshops, uh, the reason is because we really believe that uh, engineering simulation is a tool that every engineer should use and should be able to use. And therefore, we want to introduce our platform and our community to interested engineers. And we would also love to get some project fee uh, feedback from you and, and maybe your own simulations and contributions for our public simulation library. Um, maybe just a general thing about this workshop series. So we will have every week a one hour online session with a live demo and every week we'll talk about another aspect of F1 aerodynamics. You will get optional uh, homework assignments which are um, let's say uh, wrapping up the, the, the subject or the topic of the webinar 
and for the, together or for this homework assignment we for sure deliver and provide you with a lot of resources like step-by-step -step instructions etc and when you submit all your homeworks you will get the certification as well as the professional training and just some some questions which were frequently asked let's talk, uh, talk about them so first of all yes we are recording all the sessions and you will be provided with this recording as uh, as, as, uh, as soon as possible so hopefully today or latest uh, 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 tomorrow you will get the recording uh, you should, please don't start to to simulate during the uh, the webinar session uh, it's it's really better that you listen, that you can ask your questions, and later on you have more than one week to do the simulations on your own. You will learn how to simulate, and in the case you need support, we are providing for sure free instant support on our forum, uh, which you can find on simscale.com. So let's take a look at the forum. It's forum.simscale.com, and here we have a dedicated category about the F1 workshop and here you can ask all your questions and here you will also later find the recording and, and the step-by-step -step, uh, tutorials for the homework. First of all we have to talk about the basics of, of air faults and here you can see a let's say um, generic air fault which is in this case a lift producing air fault so this kind of air faults which are used uh, uh, for airplanes for example and here you can see some basic parameters of a wing so we have the leading edge here and the trailing edge and the distance between leading and trailing edge is our chord length and then we have a lower chamber and the upper chamber and below you can see a, a, a simple animation of the airflow um, around the wing and this image is, uh, can help us now to, to understand how an airfall is basically working. And there are a lot of different theories how to explain this. And so let's take a look at the vectors we can see at the arrows, and they're representing the flow, so the direction of the, uh, so the local velocity at the point. And as you can see, the flow is, is arriving together at the leading edge here and then it's separated by the upper and the lower chamber. And since um, the uh, upper chamber is, is longer, so the, this is the way from the air uh, on the upper side is longer than on the lower side, the air on the upper side has to be accelerated, otherwise it would not meet at the trailing edge. And um, the result of this is that the uh, this acceleration is that the pressure drops because the air needs some energy needs we need to or we are increasing the kinetic energy and this energy is taken from the pressure and that results in the pressure distribution you can see here so here is what i mean the, you can see the velocity distribution so the velocity is increasing at the upper side and that results in a pressure drop and this pressure difference between lower and upper side of the wing now is our down force so this is generating the force which is pushing a wing uh, uh, on uh, pushing the wing and in F1 for sure we use uh, another kind of wings so the wings are flipped and there we are creating downforce instead of lift and um, here you can see a visualization again and if we now take a look at the upper camber uh, here you can see now the velocity profile. So these vectors here are representing the the velocity uh, uh, versus the distance from the uh, 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 surface. As you can see, the velocity is growing, and this this velocity profile is very important because we here in the so-called um, boundary layer. So this is a very thin layer in the near of the physical wall of the wing where we have a strong interaction between the wall and the flow. And this profile is very characteristic for a wing. And the reason for this profile is that the velocity of the air directly on the surface is zero because we have, it's, it's sticking there. And at the outside, or as far we, as we go more far away from the surface, it uh, becomes uh, uh, the velocity or the free stream velocity. And 
In this profile, in the so-called boundary layer, the most uh, important physical effects are ta uh, taking place, and therefore this is a very important part of the simulation. And one thing uh, which is um, uh, very important is, since we have no slip at the uh, surface of the wing, we have shear stress here. And for example, by increasing the angle of attack of the wing, it's it's possible to to increase the downforce since the velocity increase this increase the velocity. But there is a point where this effect stops, where the um, where you cannot increase the, the the lift anymore by changing the angle of attack, and this is what we call flow separation. What you can see here. And the reason for the separation is that the kinetic energy of the of the of air is too low to follow the surface, and then it's separating. Okay. And as you know, in Formula One, we are not using single wings; we are using multi-element wings. And here you can see such a multi-element wing. And um, they're using instead of a big wing, you're losing um, several profiles which are arranged like this and the reason why we're doing this is that using uh, some so-called multi-element wings is increasing the efficiency of the whole wing because we are bringing new energy to the boundary layer through this gaps between the profiles and the optimization of the gaps by the way is a very fundamental uh, um, let's say it's a very very fundamental part of the work of uh, uh, aerodynamics since this is and just for this uh, the optimization of these parameters can take a lot of time and another important thing you can see here is is the so-called vertex shading so um, that it's uh, and this is a lot of times it's uh, people call this turbulence which is wrong this is a vertex and this vortex is gen generated by the wing because of the velocity difference between the upper and the lower side. And so the, the air, with the, which is uh, with a higher speed, is going to the uh, upper side where it's a lower speed. And then we have this vortex. And here you can see animation. Of, and this is a, a, a single airfoil. And the moving plane shows the total pressure coefficient. And here you can see how this vertex is generated. And here this blue point is the vertex. And here, for example, you can see another visualization. Here we have so-called ESA contours. And here you can really see how big this vertex becomes. And you can see, for example, the vortices. Uh, magnitude here. Yes, this is a fluid flow simulation of a, a full Formula One car, and also here you can see how these vortexes are generated on several parts of the car. Yes, and then basically when it comes to dynamics, we're talking about multiple forces. First of all, we have a force which we don't like so much, a so-called drag which is in the end produced in the same way like the lift because of the pressure difference and the and uh, the drag is basically made out of two parts. One part of the drag is the smaller part which is uh, related to the to the uh, surface friction between air and the body itself and then we have the bigger part of the drag which is created by the low pressure region behind the car which is like sucking back the car. And then we also have the force we like, the so-called lift, which is generated mainly by the front wing, the rear wing, and the underfloor of the diffuser of the car. And we have, here you can see, for example, the distribution of, of, of downforce. So half of the downforce is generated by the underbody with the diffuser, and a quarter by the front wing, and another quarter by the rear wing. And because a lot of people uh, are very interested in that, a Formula 1 car can create up to 2.5 tons of downforce, which is the weight of an elephant. Okay, so I think we know 
or you now knew the fundamentals of, of aerodynamics of a wing and uh, one thing is to develop a car let's say in the lab but the other thing is to to drive with the car on the real world racetrack and Besides the development of, a, of, a, of the shape of the car, another very important point is to adapt this design to different racetrack characteristics. And here you can see two very famous racetracks. On the left side, uh, you can see uh, this, uh, uh, the circuit, the street circuit, which is used in Monaco. And on the right side, you can see um, the race circuit in Monza, which is a high-speed racetrack and Mo Monaco is let's say the, the slowest race of the year Monza is one of the fastest races in the year and here you can see the different rearings designed for example the Mercedes team used some years ago and on the left side the design for Monaco on the right side the rearing design for um, Monza so we have this high downforce here pre package left and you can see we have a, a very large kind of wing so using the full length we can we have for the wing and it's a we have a very high angle of attack in addition we have the modification of the louvres here this the slots on the end plates uh, we will talk about the the role of them in the next session by the way and by by using a modified short wing and a lower angle of attack uh, we have this uh, creating this low downforce package, which is used on on tracks like Mon uh, Monza, where we need uh, downforce is not so important, but but reducing the drag, since the drag is uh, very high on on this this uh, straight sear, and by using this wing we can reduce it. And the general idea is to maximize or to minimize the lap time by using the optimal aerodynamical setup. Yes, and maybe just because a lot of you are interested in that uh, how a F1 car is actually made all the F1 teams are running very big design offices some of them are bigger like the design offices of the top teams and the small independent teams for sure have, have less uh, less resources and less employees and uh, the whole car, as you know, is designed using CAD, so using computers to model the surfaces and build assemblies out of them. And um, there is a kind of uh, uh, single parts which are designed, but in the end, single parts are not investigated. So all the teams are using like 90-90% of the capacities for full-time, uh, full car simulations and full car wind tunnel tests. And you can see how complex these models are. So this is just, I think, a, a image of the CAT model, of the wind tunnel model of a leading F1 team. And you can see how many different surfaces are used. And just to model one of the surfaces can take a lot of, lot of time. And yes, after the car was designed, or it's more in general, or in reality, it's more like a, a loop process. So they are doing modifications on the car using, for example, fluid flow simulations to, to make a virtual wind tunnel test and then the insights and the results of the wind, virtual wind tunnel test as well as the real wind tunnel test are used to improve the design. And for this, one very important thing is the so-called uh, is, is, uh, is the HPC infrastructure. So from the one teams are running very very um, big computers which are needed for the fluid flow simulations the good thing is using sim scale you don't need this uh, since it's cloud based and all computing power comes from the cloud yes and i also talked already about wind tunnels so we have on the one hand simulation to optimize and test uh, the performance of the car but Teams also have physical test facilities with the wind tunnel. And this wind tunnel is very, very important. So here you can see uh, the wind tunnel of two different F1 teams. And this wind tunnel, modern, modern F1 teams are using so-called 60-person models. So as they have 60% of the size of the real car. These models are specially built just for the wind tunnel test. So they most of them have a kind of, of, of basic frame made of aluminium and then they're using mainly 3d printing and and uh, a carbon fiber parts to to modify the model and to 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 build 
parts like front wings, etc. And the good thing is that uh, both is necessary, simulation and wind tunnel. And one of the most uh, challenging uh, uh, aspects of F1 engineering is uh, the validation between wind tunnel and uh, simulation. Guys, I see you wrote already some questions. Uh, I would like to answer all the questions at the end if it's okay, just so that you know. I see your questions and we will answer them later on. Okay, and, and another important, or let's say the third aspect of this testing is track testing. And the process is like most of the designs are first investigated with simulation. The most promising ideas are tested in the wind tunnel and then really the all the best ideas are then tested on with a real car on track and for these teams are using different technologies like for example this assemblies here which are looking quite funny these are in the end uh, a lot of pressure sensors and then that allows them to uh, measure the pressure distribution behind behind the tires in a lot of different points while driving around the circuit and it sounds maybe strange, but a lot of times there's really a big difference between what you've expected from wind tunnel and testing and simulation and what you really measure in the real world on the track. And there's the same kind of device at the rear available like this one used by Ferrari. Another thing you maybe notice sometime is a so-called this color. It's a yes, yellow or red color which you're applying on the surface on the car and then you can see how the flow is streaming on the surface. Here you have an example image, for example. <laughs> so here you can see the way of the flow on the surface of this Red Bull F1 car. And here the same on a wind tunnel model. And for example, it helps you to, to you can really see with the help of this color's flow separations, etc. Yes, uh, this is by uh, another good example uh, how CFD simulations, so, so fluid flow simulation and wind tunnel uh, are working together. So here on the right side, you see, for example, here, uh, right side top, you can see um, a cut, a cut through uh, the front tire of F1 car, and on the left side, you have uh, the results before CFD optimization, the right side after the CFD optimization. And the upper row was showing CFD results and the uh, lower row was showing the wind tunnel results. And uh, first of all, what you can see, there is a kind of um, difference between um, wind tunnel test and real world uh, wind tunnel measure uh, data. And this is not a problem. This this difference, you have them every time. The only important thing is that the difference is the same every time. This is what you try to achieve. And here, for example, you can see how they modified the shape of the um, they modified the shape of the car and how that helped to to uh, uh, improve the direction of the flow because before the optimization, uh, it was like um, parallel to the to the x-axis, the direction of the flow. And now it's not parallel anymore. It's going more up. And this upwash helps to create uh, or to reduce the drag of the full car because then you have a kind of that water zone behind the tires and you try to make this that water zone as big as possible. And uh, this is what happens if you have a flow, flow field like here on the right side. Yes, and maybe one thing which is very important, uh, currently in F1, they try to limit the resources of the teams to make the competition more fair, because right now it's like uh, that as more money you have, uh, as more resources you can buy, and for this there is a kind of limit, so the teams have to decide, they can only use 30 units per week, and they have to uh, uh, choose so one unit is one teraflop of CFD computing. So one teraflop means one teraflop of computational effort or one hour wind tunnel. And so you can decide you can have zero wind tunnel testing and 30 teraflops CFD computing a week. You can have 15 teraflops of CFD computing and 15 hours of wind tunnel a week as you like or as the team likes to do. Yes, and another thing which is uh, used uh, a lot of times is so-called parametric optimization, what we will do at the last session. Here you can see animation, which was made with cases. Cases is a tool which allows you to modify the shape of a rear wing very simple. 
And um, for this, uh, we have defined different modifications, like modification of the chord length, of the angle of attack, and then you can automatically generate like hundreds of different geometries and simulate them and choose which one is the best. Yes, yeah, so here you can see over of the picture sources if you want to, and then you will now switch to the live demonstration. Thank you very much. Yes. Before we start to set up the simulation itself, let's say we just talk about SimScale 30 seconds because a lot of people uh, asked me, for example, where can I download SimScale? And that is not necessary and also not possible because SimScale is a web-based CAE platform. So in the end, what would be what we're doing at SimScale here, we'd, we've developed uh, uh, really a simulation environment, a 3D simulation tool, which runs completely in a standard web browser. So you only need internet connection, web browser, and you can access a very powerful simulation engineering tool. And SimScale is more than a web-based tool. It also brings together content and people. So we have a public accessible uh, simulation library, which you can find on our website on simscale.com here on the community public project and here we have thousands of ready to use simulation projects which you can import for free to your simulation workspace including the geometry including all the settings and the simulation results and you can also create your own projects and make them public and we also have our forum, which I uh, mentioned already. So our idea at SimScale is really to create one place where you can, where everybody meets who wants to learn and apply engineering simulation. And the good thing is you can use SimScale as much as you want for free, but if you have a free account, all your park projects will become public so that other users can also benefit from your uh, setups and ideas. Yes, and now let's start to set up our simulation. We'll today do a fluid flow simulation of a Formula 1 front wing. And for this, first of all, we need a CAD geometry, which we have, and I will provide you with the geometry later on. And the first part is to so-called meshing. Since a simulation is done on a computer, you cannot save an infinite number of data. And that's the reason why you have defined before how, what kind of resolution you want to have on your simulation. And here you can see the so-called mesh, the surface of the mesh we will use later on. And in every center of this element, so we are dividing the, the surface into a lot of small, small triangles or hexaedas. And in the center of all these elements, we are calculating uh, quantities like flow velocity and pressure only. And after you've created this mesh, you have to set up the simulation, so how your model is interacting with the environment, and then you can analyze the results and use it to improve your design. But we will do this step by step. First of all, let's think what we want to do. I mean, we want to investigate the aerodynamic properties of the front wing. And let's just imagine we'll talk about a full car it makes no difference if we're talking about a car or just a part of the car and this is the geometry of our part we want to to use for our external flow simulation the first and maybe most important thing you have to understand is you're interested in the flow around this object not the flow within through this object therefore we are not interested in the car itself we are interested into the domain around the car and so this gray face is what we want to simulate and investigate and not the white one. And therefore, first of all, we have to create a kind of negative of our geometry, which we call the fluid flow domain, which is our, let's say, virtual wind tunnel. And then, as I mentioned, we have to create a mesh. And we are only calculating the physical quantities in the center of these elements here. And therefore, uh, then the density or the size of uh, this, this element is directly related to the accuracy of our simulation. And now the idea, or now our challenge is to create such a, such a mesh only for this flow domain. 
and to make it fine there where we think we need a, a high accuracy and coarse there where we think a high accuracy is not very necessary at all. And for example, in the near of walls or around the car, we need a fine uh, mesh because there we expect a lot of changes, but in the far away, it's not very important. And to create this, creating this, to create this mesh can be very challenging. But we have a very nice tool on SimScale called SnapPX Mesh, which has a very unique approach to create this mesh. It's very straightforward, and it's based on uh, a so-called background mesh, which you can see here. So first of all, we only meshing the whole, this whole area here, also the inside of the car, and then. We're refining this mesh and deleting cells which we don't need later on to create the final mesh. So first of all, we have the background mesh, and then this background mesh is fine based on your settings, and you can refine edges of your geometry and also full surfaces. And once all refinements were performed, so the surface all edge refinements, uh, Snappy Hex Mesh is deleting the inner part of the mesh which is not needed. Then we are applying region refinements if defined, and then the mesh is projected on the surface of the body. So this is process is called snapped. And finally, you can also add a special kind of refinement, which is called layer addition on surfaces, as it will help you uh, to increase the accuracy simulation in the boundary layer of the flow. Okay, then. Let's start. And I've prepared something. So um, this is the project I prepared, which contains only the geometry of the front wing. And later on, I will provide you all with this project so you can import it, and then you have access to the geometry. And now we are on, Sims, uh, uh, on the platform, Simska platform, by the way. This is a 3D model of the front wing. You can also upload your own CAD model using the CAD upload button. Yes. And the first thing you can see here, we have a full front wing. But since it's a symmetrical simulation, we, it's a symmetric, symmetric body, we can only simulate half of the wing, which will also reduce the uh, computational effort we, we have. And before we continue, maybe let's just take a final look at the latest simulation setup. So if this is our fluid flow domain, and we want the flow to enter on the left side and leave the domain on the right side, uh, we have to define it somehow. And therefore, we need later on so-called boundary condition. And just to understand the physics, on the left side here, on this left edge, we need the velocity for all these points, because this is our inlet velocity. What we don't know is the pressure. On the right side, we need the pressure. It's a, the uh, environment pressure. What we don't need know is the velocity distribution on this edge. On the floor, we need the velocity because what you should not forget, in reality, the car is moving through the air and not the air around the car. Therefore, the floor has no relative velocity uh, with the air and therefore the floor has the same velocity like this uh, inlet. So we have here and here the same velocity in x direction. We don't need the pressure. And the upper wall and the side walls, they should not interact with the flow because they are not inter existing in reality. Therefore we use so-called slip walls, which are uh, special walls which are not interacting with the flow. Okay, but now... And Sorry, last thing. On the face of the wall, as I mentioned, the velocity is zero, so we need to know the velocity, and we don't know the pressure, and the pressure distribution on the car is, in the end, what we want to find out. Okay, but now let's set up the simulation. So first of all, as I mentioned, we need to create the mesh. And for this, we click here on the meshes item in the tree. This tree is guiding us all the time through our mesh simulation project, and click the Create New Mesh button. Then you can choose this uh, geometry you want to mesh. In this case, we only have one geometry, our front wing, and then you click the Save button. And then a new mesh project or mesh uh, uh, is created. And here you can see, for example, the dimension of a CAT model, just to make sure that uh, there are no issues with scaling, and that makes sense. 
And then we can add the new mesh operation to create the mesh. And we will choose Snappy X Mesh, which is our dedicated mesher for, 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 for CFD simulations. And first of all, we will save the setting. And then the project tree is built. And the first thing we have to define is our fluid flow domain. We can modify them using this base mesh box item. And let's first of all take a look. And this domain would not make sense because first of all, the distance between the floor and the rear wing is much too high and this distance has a very big effect on the performance of the wing. The other hand, the inlet and the outlet are too not far away uh, enough from the wing. And so we will modify the dimension first of all. And now this is our new domain with the modified distance to the floor. And we've also increased the overall size of this bounding box. And next, as I mentioned, we have to define the base, base mesh size. And for this, we just have to say how many cells we want to split this box, the base mesh box in every direction. And since we want to have the base mesh size of a half meter, we will use 50 elements in X direction and 10 elements in Y and Z direction. And we will also specify the number of cores we want to use for the simulation at C32. So this will increase our meshing later on. Okay, and what we also have to define is the so-called material point, because as you know, there is this point where we are deleting the, the background in a part of the background mesh. And to decide where he should remove the cells, he needs a point. And in this case, a point, this just needs to be a point which is outside of the geometry, but inside of the domain. And there are like infinite number of points, and we will use this point here, which is here. Here is the point. And it's inside the domain and outside of the wing. Okay. And now we can, or finally, we'll also define uh, another box around the wing, which we'll later use for our volume refinement. So we'll create a new Cartesian box with following dimensions. This one here, and this will be later on refined. This area, uh, this 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 uh, domain, this subdomain. Okay, and now we can add the mesh refinements. We'll start with the uh, feature refinement, which is the refinement of the edge. And here we will just have to specify a angle for the edges. So everything should be expected as an edge with a include angle uh, uh, up to 150 degree. And we want to have a refinement level of 8, 1 millimeter away from the edges. And 8 means that the, the, the base, mesh, base mesh cell with the length uh, of half a meter will be split at 8 times. Then we will also create a surface refinement and apply it on the whole ring. And we will choose a lower minimum level of 7 and a maximum level of 8. So the tool will automatically refine all the faces of the wing with the level between 7 and 8. What we also need then is the region refinement. There we want cell size level of 4. And we'll apply it on the Cartesian box we just created. And finally, we'll also add the layer elements, which improve the representation of the boundary layer later on. So we will first of all add a layer to all surfaces of the wing. Select all surfaces. And we will also add layers on the floor of our bounding box. You will only use three layers. 
and call it layers wall. Okay, great. And now we are basically done and we can start our mesh operation. And we will modify it when the meshing is finished. And since it can take up to 10 or 20 minutes, I've already prepared a project which contains a mesh. Here. So later the mesh looks like this. So this is the uh, and here you can see the mesh. So this is the front wing. You can see here the refinement on the surfaces between 7 and 8, the edge refinement. Then you can see here the result of the refinement box. And by the way, you can also see the layers. So here are the layers of the floor. And here are the layers on the front wing. Okay, great, then let's do a quick wrap up. So I showed you how to create the base setup for Snappy X Mesh. That means to include the geometry and to create the base mesh box and to define the base mesh cell size. Then I showed you how to create geometrical primitives like the Cartesian box for refinement, how to create refinements in general. And we also talked about some enhanced settings like uh, the number of processes we want to use. And there are also some advanced topics which we cannot cover in our webinar today. First of all, so-called cat cleaning. As you may be recognized, the model I showed you does not contain any screws or any holes, which are maybe later on really in the in the production cat model, but which would only which are not needed for a simulation because the influence of a screw is very very slow, very very small. But the uh, um, effort, the computational effort, would increase very very strongly and therefore we try to reduce the model as much as possible. Another important point is the so-called mesh quality assignment. I mean if you take a look here uh, then you can see in the meshing log that there are no problems with the mesh. So um, finished meshing without any errors and you can see if there are elements which are not fulfilling one of the criteria, and this is not the case, but uh, sometimes it's uh, important to really take a deeper look into the quality, and this is also something which is very advanced, maybe needed 1% of simulations, and is therefore not covered, and there are a lot of per tuning parameters for the mesh, which you can find here, and which are really advanced, and we will therefore not talk about them today. Okay, after the mesh is generated, the next step is the actual simulation setup. And for this, we switch to the, switch to the simulation designer. We create a new simulation here. And then, first of all, we are asked which kind of simulation we want to perform. And since we want to do a fluid flow analysis, we go on fluid dynamics, and then we have some sub-options, and we will use incompressible, since uh, aerodynamics of cars, or let's say external aerodynamics in general, up to... 200 meters or 100, 100, uh, uh, 150 meter per second, 100 meter per second are incompressible. And we have turbulence, therefore we use a turbulence model. Turbulence is very complex to compute it directly, would take too much time and resources, therefore we use a kind of submodel for turbulence, which is k omega SST. We are only interested in the, in the let's say, end result, not in, uh, uh, in the transient result, so we do a steady state simulation, only click on save. And then again, the simulation tree is built up. Okay, first of all, we have to choose the mesh we want to use for our simulation, click on save, then the mesh is added to the 3D viewer. And then we have to have defined the material uh, of the or the fluid we want to simulate. So you can enter here the uh, kinematic viscosity to find the fluid yourself, or you can access our material library. Click on there, save, and then apply it to the whole region. 
And next we have to define the initial boundary condition. The simulations are calculated step by step, so iteratively. And therefore you need a start solution. And for pressure and velocity, we don't have to modify it, but we have to define now k and omega. This are the turbulence model parameters. And these parameters have to be calculated uh, for every simulation by hand. And they are mainly on, they are only depending uh, from uh, the, le uh, the cord length of your of your wing, for example, the the kind of material. So it's air in our case, and the, sp the speed of the air. I just calculated the right value for 60 meter per seconds, which is 2.16 for k and 55.67 for omega. And later on for the homework, I will give you a table with the right values for the uh, different velocities. And now we come to the maybe most important thing. We have to define the boundary conditions. And let's switch therefore maybe back to this slide. And let's start with the inlet. So we'll change the representation. So this is our inlet here. We'll create a new boundary condition call of inlet and the type is velocity inlet so we'll choose yes and um, here you can see I wrote um, uh, I wrote a velocity fixed value and pressure is, is not known and this is what we will now apply on this wall. So let's switch back. Oh, I have to lock in again. <laughs> and open it again. Sorry, this was the wrong one. We need this project here. OK, back to simulation designer. Let's call it again, inlet. Choose this phase at here 60 meter per second in x direction. And now it's added. Then we need outlet, which is this phase on the other side. And its type is now pressure outlet. Because we know the pressure, but we don't know the velocity. So add it here. And maybe important, uh, in our sim scale, the environment pressure is zero because we are only calculating relative uh, pressure differences. So, and, and then we have a symmetry here, as I mentioned. So we will add a symmetry boundary condition here. And then we also have these two walls. which are slip walls since they should not interact with the flow. And we also need to define the boundary condition for the flow. And as I said, the flow is moving. So it's again a wall. Uh, or we can also use, sorry, velocity inlet again. Uh, a wall, sorry. And it's a moving wall. So 60 meter per seconds. And then the only thing which is missing is the wing itself. To select the wing, first of all, let's create a new boundary condition. Call it wing. And then we have to we'll select all surrounding surfaces and invert our selection. And now, sorry, I have to do it again. And here we go. Oh. Here you have to be really careful. Again, invert selection, add selection, and now it worked. Great. 
Okay, now we defined our boundary recognition. Next thing we have to change here are the numerics. Uh, when we are talking about numerics, we are referring to the algorithms and other uh, tools which are used to calculate the equation system of our simulation. And tuning or changing the, the numerical solvers can improve the quality of our simulation. So you don't really have to understand what we're doing here in detail. It's to really, as I mentioned, to optimize the, the, the quality of the simulation and the settings I'm using here. You can use them for, let's say, all external learning simulations. It's our best practice. And finally, we have to, to define how many simulation steps we want to do. Um, we want to do 1000 iterations and only save the end result. We will use 32 CPUs and define a maximum simulation time of nearly two hours. And the, really the last thing, we will add a force, uh, a moment item, which will calculate the forces after every iteration, and then we see if the, the phase is the forces which are calculated become stable. So let's call it forces. Again, so we're only selecting the wing with this invert workaround. And we have to modify the density. Okay, great. And now we can check our simulation, create a simulation run. Let's call run. It runs 60 meters per second. And then we can start the simulation run and we will receive the results. Okay. Then let's wrap it up. I showed you the general simulation setup for external aerodynamic simulations. We talked about how to define a material using the material library. We talked about the two initial condition we need for the turbulence parameters and the boundary condition assignments about the numerics and how to start the simulation. And here, also at one topic, which we're going to talk about today, first of all, how to set up a transient simulation, which is a little bit different, but not necessary right now. And also, we could talk more theoretically about numerical solver settings and advanced solver control. Yes, and I again prepared something since this simulation can take up to half an hour. So it's the same mesh, the same settings, just the results are already available. And then when your simulation is done, you will receive an email. And then first of all, you can check out the so-called res residual plot. And here you can see for every iteration how the error for different physical quantity changed. And this is exactly what we want to have. So the error becomes smaller and smaller until it's so small that it's, it's, it's become stable. And then our simulation is finished. And another thing we can also check, or we should definitely check, are the forces. And here again, the forces for uh, versus uh, the number of iterations. And you can see also the forces become stable. So our simulation was nearly finished or converged already, let's say, here. But now let's take a look into the 3D results. For this, we click on Solution Fields. Take some seconds until it's loaded. Sorry for that. It's a very big simulation. So it's now added to the 3D viewer. And you now we have again our domain here. And first of all, we'll jump to the latest simulation step. The only one we, we saved, by the way, which again can also talk, uh, can take some seconds. And then we will change the representation to pressure. Online post processing can take some time. I therefore prepared a, a simulation result analysis locally with the same tool we're using online called Paraview. And this is the result for 60 meters per second, for example. And then you can visualize the pressure distribution on the surface. You can see, as I mentioned here, the low surface, a low pressure area, the high pressure area. You can create, for example, streamlines and also slices through the domain. And if you, for example, create a slice, you can also see the vertex as we talked about in, at the beginning. So here, for example, 
can see the velocity component in Y and Z, and here, here, and here we have vortexes. Okay, so thank you very much. This was the last step of our simulation. Oh, one thing I forget about to talk. I showed you how to, how slices can look like and streamlines. Uh, you can also um, take a look at the forces using these diagrams. For example, what we're looking for is, uh, uh, for example, viscous force Z, which is uh, this uh, part of a downforce, and on the pressure force that we have both. And here you can see, for example, downforce for 60 meters is like it's like um, 784. And for 80 meters per second, it's 1,200. Okay, and yes, as I mentioned, you can do a lot of uh, online post-processing to create slices, streams, and you can also compare results of different simulation rounds there. We will give you a more detailed instruction of this online post-processor with a tutorial, and advanced topics here would be uh, the local post processing and derivation of additional physical quantities from your simulation result. Okay, great. Then I would like to present um, the homework assignment to you, which you can work on then during the next week, and then we have time for question and answers. So your homework will be to reduce the simulation I just showed you, and to use the simulation to investigate the uh, lift and uh, sorry, the downforce and drag, there's a mistake on the uh, 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 slide, um, uh, of generated by the rings for five different velocities, and that will give you a kind of chart which will look like that. And for this, you will receive uh, uh, tomorrow the step-by-step -step tutorial and the link where you can import the geometry or the project containing the geometry. Uh, if you have, need help with your simulation, you can use our forum, and when you're done, you should submit your homework using a form which you will also find in the forum and in the instructions. Great, then we have now time for your questions. Um, if you have a question, just write it there, and I will uh, then answer them. If you already wrote it, uh, don't write it again, we have them all here. And I will try to, to, to get Akram involved again. Akram, can you hear me? Yeah, just a second. Great. So we will now answer your questions Hi, together. I'm so Thanks. sorry for this problem. It was like technical problem, unexpected problem. So I'm sorry, guys. Hope the next time we can do it more better. Raphael, and he asked if the geometry needs to be watertight for the meshing. And Raphael, yes. In general, the geometry should be watertight because otherwise it would, the sim scale thinks or the tool thinks there is a hole in the geometry uh, and would mesh inside it and then the floor would enter the inside of our wing. But as long as the, uh, I mean, a, a step model is, is uh, uh, closed most of the time and as long as the gap is smaller than your smallest element you want to use, it is not a problem. And another question is, which Sims fi uh, file format SimScale accepts and SimScale is gap step and I just files, as well as STL files, you can import meshes and also use the BREP geometrical model. Uh, another question is, what units we're using? We're unit standard SE units, so meter, kilogram, second, etc. Raphael wants to know if it's possible to stretch the elements. I'm not sure if I get the question right, but um, it is possible to use also stretched elements for the base mesh, but I would not recommend, recommend it to you since you should be a more experienced user to play around with that. And then another question is what are the specs for the computer laptop to use SimScale? And basically they are not really really fixed specs you need. The only thing we recommend is it should you, sh you need a fast internet connection. It should not it should be at least not a too old computer like you should have two or four gigabyte of RAM if possible and a 3D graphic card. Uh, Tom, uh, Thomas asked what's the role of the layers? 
and um, because there's already mesh refinement in the near of the wing. Yes, that's right. But as I mentioned, maybe let's go back to the related slide. Um, we have this velocity profile in the boundary layer. And in this velocity profile, we would even need a very more fine mesh. And to save elements, we use the stretch prism element element, layer elements, to resolve this profile gradient here in the near of the wall. Okay. Then, um, next question is, um, You added a refinement box around the front wing. Since you added a volumetric space, do you need to specify inlet and outlet conditions for the refinement box? This question was asked by Girish. And Girish, no, that's not possible since um, refinement boxes uh, are not creating any inlet or outlet faces. So it's used to refine the mesh, but there are no, there is no surface in the later mesh where the refinement box was. So your inlet and outlet are not changing. Anirut asks, uh, when performing a CF analysis of any vehicle, how important is it to consider ground defect? That's a good question, and the ground effect in general is very important, especially for road cars. So you may, should make sure that the distance between your bounding box, the lower face of your bounding box, and your car or the object you want to simulate is really the right distance you, you, you want to, to have. Uh, okay. Um, Raphael also wants to know, how do I know what the base pressure and temperature are so I can actually know the Reynolds number of the simulation? Yes, and um, for calculating the Reynolds number, you don't need the pressure or the temperature. The only thing you need is the kinematic viscosity, which you are defining, and the velocity, inlet velocity, which you are also defining. And temperature is not considered in the simulation, so we're assuming in this kind of type of simulation the temperature should be constant. Yes, I hope that answered also your question. Thomas asked, are the conversion criteria available for automatic stopping the simulation? Yes, and that is available. I, what Thomas means is that sometimes you don't know how many iterations you need. Then you can define criteria like, for example, uh, 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 minimum uh, 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 residual for any of these quantities, and in the moment where you reach this minimum residual, um, the simulation automatically stops, and you can define this under um, numerics here with absolute and relative tolerance. Okay, then we have still some more questions. Um, Um, sorry, got so many questions. Just have to sort them a little bit. When <laughs> uh, Saturary asked, when will I obtain the certificate? Yes, we will send out certificates via email about one or two weeks after the last session. For everyone who did all homework, for sure, only. Um, Jean wants to know, for the homework, what is the estimated CP hours for, for run each run? Um, we will write them into the every tutorial, but as you know, you can, during this webinar, or during this workshop series, and also later on, you can use as many CP hours as you want for your public simulations. Uh, Jimero asks, compared to the meshing you made, how good is the automatic SnapyX mesh for exterior flow? Yes, this automatic SnapyX mesh uh, is creating the mesh as the name says automatically, so there you only have to define the base mark size. It's not bad, but for such complex geometries like a front wing, I would really recommend to do the meshing manually. 
Vladimir wants to know if you can upload uh, uh, meshes which uh, you created with your other, with third party software. Yes, that's possible. For this, you just have to go to the mesh creator and import and uh, upload a mesh, and then you can choose different formats for uh, and upload your own mesh. Um, Okay, Manan wants to know if we have any maximum capacities in terms of mesh size. Yes, there are. Is this a theoretical limit right now of about 80 million cells, which is really, really, really big. This simulation has about 2 million cells, but in, if there will be a case where you would need, com need more computing power for a commercial project, for example, we can also make that happen. Um, Rahul wants to know how you can get the values of k and omega. If you want to calculate these values yourself, I will post uh, into the step by step tutorial the link to a calculator, online based calculator, where you can calculate k and omega yourself based on the length of your object, the, kinemat uh, the kinematic viscosity, and the, 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 the uh, speed. Next question is uh, by Likit. In the case of multiple wings, how do you decide on the gap between the two f or, or uh, consecutive faults? Yes, um, this is really a good question. If I would know a kind of formula, uh, I would open our own F1 team. Or, but in general, um, there are some rules, but this is really very detailed and uh, very low level aerodynamics. Uh, high level aerodynamics, sorry. Um, basically, what you do you to find it out, you can try different gaps and then you just see for which gap you have the, the, the maximum uh, uh, increase of, of velocity. Uh, okay. Sorry, yes, there was some people ask. Why there was lift force in the homework? Sorry, there was a typo for sure. It's downforce. So in aerodynamics, we're talking sometimes about lift when we are talking about or when we are referring to downforce. So then it's kind of negative lift. But we will modify this this, this term for the step by step instructions. Uh, Menon also asked if I could explain how the parallelization works as a surface in the cloud. Yes, for sure. We have some scale. We have very large computing resources, very large clusters. And when you choose the number of uh, processors you want to use, that is then the number of processors on our machines which is used. So in the end, your all simulators are running on a very, very big high performance computer of ours. And we can scale how many processors a simulation process gets. Uh, okay, then Charlotte asked if K Omega turbulence model is a standard practice in F1 industry, or do they use their own turbulence models or RANs or like or something like LES? Maybe Akram can answer this question. Akram, can you hear me? Yeah, please can you okay. hear me. Sorry. Questions? Yes. Uh, someone wants to know if F1 teams are also using the K Omega turbulence model or if they're using their own turbulence models or models like LES or DES. Yeah, so the idea is uh, approximately for, especially for the the Formula One, they use K Omega SST as the main uh, turbulence model. Many teams use the K Omega SST, so yeah, it's the, the main use of uh, turbulence for F1. And also, and also for some cases, they use like uh, they run like uh, some NCD flow. Uh, I'm not really sure if they use uh, the LES simulation. I'm not sure about this, but for uh, URANs or the instead URANs, uh, yeah, they do. And for the steady simulation, generally, it's uh, runs uh, k omega SST. Thank you, Akrab. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, but is if we can calculate or SIMS can calculate something like downforce lift only for a dedicated part? Yes, that's also possible. And then you would just create 
multiple of the result control items and only add the part to this you want to investigate with the, re uh, with the related result control item. So we could, for example, create a result control item for every every wing element, and then we would get uh, this dia this graphs for for uh, downforce and lift for for every single wing element. Okay, then there are still some more questions. I hope, uh, but we, we have time. We can answer them all. Um, Liquid wants to know how the pressure distribution behind the front tire affects the overall drag of the vehicle. Maybe Akram can also again answer to these questions. All right, uh, please can you repeat it again? Yes. Uh, Sabo wants to know how the pressure distribution behind the front tire affects the overall drag of the vehicle. Affects the whole drag of the vehicle? Yes. All right, so uh, first, uh, like you know, the tire is uh, not the right aerodynamic shape, so it creates large weight behind the car, uh, behind the tire. So uh, this region is like low pressure region, and from the front you have the stagnation pressure. So this difference between the two uh, pressures will create really high drag, and approximately the the major uh, part that generates maximum drag is the tires, and also the problem for the the weight of the tires is th this flow is low kinetic energy flow so if this flow will go to the side pod region or the inlet and the, the inlet of the radiators and the leading edge of the floor if this low uh, energy flow will go to this region will affect the, the performance of the car so uh, yeah for this reason uh, this uh, turbulent uh, so this low kinetic energy flow behind the tires affect the, the whole uh, drag of the car and not only the drag but also downforce so affect all the performance of the, the car. Thank you very right. much Akrem. Thank you very much Akrem. Next question is um, a lot of people ask if they can upload CAD CATIA models. No it's not possible to upload a CAD part file but you can export a step file out of CATIA and import it then to SimScale. Okay, next question is if SimScale also supports tetrahedral meshing. Yes, we do. In the options, you also have, um, if we would create, would create you know, a new mesh, for example, we could also choose, uh, for example, tet meshing. Uh, but this is not really recommended since uh, for this complex geometry the hexagonal mesh is really more robust and faster. Okay. Mm, then we have still so many more questions. Um, okay. Then, guys, we have so many questions. Please don't write any new questions since we're uh, running out of time. But if you have a question which was not answered already, you can also send me an email and it will answer the question then uh, via email. Uh, Krishna wants to know which drag is more prominent here. Uh, so the surface drag or the pressure drag? And for sure, it is the pressure drag which is uh, 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 more prominent at this point. And uh, then also Juan wants to know what is the minimum, maximum Y plus requirements for the uh, SST model. Uh, it's between 1 and 300, but should not be smaller than 1. OK, guys, then. Um, Yes, if you have any problems, just contact me or use our forum and they will get, I think, the fastest help. Thank you very much. Also, thank you very much, Akram, for joining us. Then you will receive an email from me the tomorrow, including a link to the record and instructions for the homework. Hope to see you next week. I will send you everything as soon as I can. Thank you very much. It was a big pleasure. See you next week. Bye.